at number 10, birthday. I would have thought that Jesus' birthday would have been one of the most straightforward things about him in regards to facts about him, but apparently his birthday is one of the biggest mysteries that surround him. Though many people believe that Jesus was born on December 25th, aka Christmas, cause happy birthday Jesus, there's a debate that suggests that the date that a lot of people celebrate as Jesus' birthday is incorrect. In 2008, an astronomer named David Renicki suggested that the star of Bethlehem, a celestial event commonly associated with Jesus' birth, may have actually been a phenomenon where the planets Venus and Jupiter came together to form a bright light in the sky. Using computer modeling, David was able to determine that this celestial event took place sometime around June 17th in the year 2 BCE. This means that perhaps Jesus was a Gemini, not a Sagittarius, whatever that means. Other researchers have placed Jesus' birth sometime in October of the year 7 BCE, and others have suggested that Jesus was born sometime in the spring because of the tales of his birth mentioning shepherds watching over their flock on the night that Jesus was born, which is something that would have been done in the spring and not the winter. Number 9. Where was he born? So we've covered what day he was born, and it turns out Christmas in October sounds pretty awesome. Let's just combine our favorite holidays and get it done with. But now we have to cover the next important topic, where was he born? Well, according to biblical sources, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This is widely known at this point, but perhaps it's not completely accurate. The New Testament Gospels don't agree on this. They don't believe Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Some of them don't even mention it once. In fact, some don't mention the Lord at all. Biblical studies are asking why Jesus was called a Nazarene and a Galilean through the New Testament and with no mention of his birthplace, obviously people will ask questions. Was he born in Nazareth? Well, Philip J. King answered this question in his Biblical Views column. He said the towns of Bethlehem is traditionally Jesus' birthplace and Nazareth is Jesus' home. It's like when you say you're from the city, but you're not really from the city. You know what I mean? At number 8, married. Out of the things that we know about Jesus Christ, one thing that remains unsolved is his marital status. Was Jesus married or not? Obviously they didn't have Tinder back then to meet people and there was no MySpace top 10 to really give us a clue of who Jesus was close to. So so really we only have speculation, theories, and some clues to go off to try and solve the mystery of whether or not Jesus had a wife. Some biblical scholars have suggested that Jesus was married and that his wife was Mary Magdalene, a woman who was frequently mentioned in the New Testament. In the Gospel of Philip, there is evidence to suggest that Jesus was married as there are words in the manuscript that read, quote, there were three who always walked with the Lord, Mary his mother, her sister, and Magdalene, the one who was called his companion. End quote. On top of that, in a recently discovered scrap of papyrus known as the Gospel of Jesus' Wife, the document contained lines which said, quote, Jesus said to them, my wife. End quote. There is no definite proof of whether or not Jesus was married in fact or not, so this remains a mystery. Number seven, Jesus' body. We haven't found the body of Jesus, of course, thousands of years later. This task is proving to be quite difficult. And according to the Bible, Jesus died but returned after three days and then suddenly vanished. His body is said to just not exist anymore. Where's the body? Where did it go? Did someone steal it? Let's talk. In order to preserve a body in the first place for that amount of time, you need to be a pro at mummification. And Romans nor Jews practiced such a thing at that time. So if you did find a tomb, the tomb of Jesus per se, his bones, well, they turned to dust about 100 years after his death. So it would be empty. There's many who believe the body of Jesus was removed from the tomb before Easter Sunday, or like I said, it was stolen. Either way, it was for sure empty. The Romans were in charge of law and order at this time, so there's also a theory where Romans took his body, but, <clears throat> but there's no motivation there that checks out. Because if they stole a body, they could have brought it out at any time and then halted Christian faith. Did Jesus' disciples take the body as well? Still the biggest mystery right here, folks. At number six, crucified. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is seen as one of the most important events in the Christian gospel. According to the gospel, Jesus was crucified at the hands of Pontius Pilate, and the skies darkened for hours afterwards. Some see this event as a miracle or an omen of dark times that lied ahead. Some researchers have tried to explain this phenomenon using astronomy. Some tie the event of Jesus' crucifixion to a solar eclipse that lasted two minutes in 29 CE, and others say that a second total eclipse caused a darkness over four minutes back in 33 CE. Either way, this phenomenon is still inexplicable and remains yet another mystery. Number five, resurrection. 
On the third day after his crucifixion, Christ was resurrected. We call this event Easter. It's a major feast day of the church, and these accounts of Christ being reborn can now be found in the four Gospels, Mark, Luke, Matthew, and John. In the letters of the Apostle Paul, found in the New Testament, it's again stated that Christ rose from the dead. Now, some are convinced that disciples of the Lord were not telling lies, but even so, Jesus could have been resurrected in a non-physical form. But in Luke 24, 39, Jesus himself denied that he was a spirit. He said, look at my hands and my feet, it is myself. Touch me and see, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. The disciples were also the first non-believers too, Luke 24, 11, and these words appealed to them as nonsense and they would not believe in them. The risen Christ appeared to his disciples in the upper room, which was behind locked doors, and then he disappeared in front of their eyes. But how? The resurrection of Jesus Christ, of course, is one of the biggest mysteries. At number four, the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin has been highly debated and, dare I say, shrouded in mystery. Huh? The shroud is said to have covered Jesus' body after the crucifixion and shows a faint image of a man's face and torso believed to be Jesus himself. This find has been debated for years and the more research and testing people do, the more muddled things get. The search for the shroud's authenticity has been going on for decades and there's still no definitive answer of whether it is real or not and if the face and torso seen in the shroud really do belong to Jesus as well. The Catholic Church doesn't have a stance on whether or not the shroud is authentic, but some Science is determined to get to the bottom of this mystery. Carbon dating has suggested that the cloth is less than 8,000 years old, meaning that it may have come from some time in the Middle Ages. But a study done in 2014 suggested that perhaps an ancient earthquake that affected Jerusalem may have created an ionic image in the shroud as well as, quote, altered the radiocarbon levels that later suggested that the shroud was a medieval forgery, end quote. Right now, there are more questions to be answered than ever before, so it may be a while before this mystery is solved. Number three, pagan god? One of the biggest mysteries surrounding Jesus Christ, many believe, is that he was a pagan god. Typically, Jesus is compared to gods like Horus or Osiris, but deities were also born from a virgin. Deities also referred to themselves as the son of God. They too performed miracles. They also died and came back. Authors of the book, The Jesus Mysteries, Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy, believe that Christianity wasn't this new revelation, and in fact, it was a continuation of paganism, just with a new name. They believe the story of Jesus is not the late tale of a Messiah, but rather a Jewish reworking of pagan myth, particularly the god Osiris Dionysus, which had already been widely known about in the ancient Mediterranean. Osiris Dionysus, born on the same day before three shepherds, offered his followers baptism and then died at Easter. These guys go off in this book, and they blame humans for not understanding ancient spirituality enough to recognize that these were just, in fact, myths. Retelling older myths to create newer ones, that was normal in the ancient world. At number two, walking on water. Perhaps the biggest mystery surrounding Jesus Christ is whether it is true that he really did walk on water. Jesus is said to have performed a number of miracles, but one of his most famous ones was walking on water. People have been trying to explain this phenomenon for ages, but it still remains a mystery. Jesus claimed to have walked on the water of the Sea of Galilee, and research suggests that this might be true, however the water might have been frozen at the time. Researchers have suggested that there might have been a cold snap that caused the fresh water lake to freeze over, and Jesus could have just stood on a floating patch of ice, and this could explain the phenomenon, but it's not exactly confirmed. And finally, number one, water into wine. Okay, so now we're getting into some party tricks that Jesus could pull off. The whole walking on water thing is pretty impressive, but when he turns water into wine, okay, now we're talking. But where did this come from? Could he really do that? Make mythological Merlot? On the third day, there was a wedding in Galilee. Jesus was there, and so was his mother Mary. And like most weddings, there was a fair amount of wine spilled. So much so that they ran out. Sounds like a pretty good wedding. There were, however, six jars of water nearby, and when some was gifted to the master of the banquet, he was shocked. After all that wine, he said, this was the best of the night, and it was just a jar of water a minute ago. This is mind-blowing. This is one of the biggest things that we talk about when it comes to J-Bones. This was one of the earliest signs that revealed his glory. Did Jesus alter the molecular composition of water? Maybe, but was it wine or was it really grape juice? After all that wine that they bragged about drinking, maybe the best wine that was saved for last was actually flavored water and they were in fact hammered. The first sip of water after a night out tastes pretty amazing, so I'd be confused too. Number 10, history. 
ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC. Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion, so how's that? She ruled over what's considered the wealthy period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh Hatshepsut because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache so I kind of want a fake one myself. Lastly there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth though recently in 2015 when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdou El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight, Berlin bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum, a little piece of Egypt Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, it's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust, scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered, a totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in Germans' hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with the little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After 
after radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasure, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. Number five, original plans. Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though, is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet, or finished at least. So instead, they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV-62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close. Let's just give me a shovel. I'll get in there. I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three, brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut. So there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as Pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two, her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believed that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming Pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Number 10, Cleopatra the Seventh. Cleopatra is one of the most well-known names when it comes to ancient queens and kings of Egypt, but did you know that Cleopatra we're seeing referenced in numerous film adaptations was actually the seventh Cleopatra? not the first or second or third or fourth. Seventh, Egypt's last active pharaoh born in 69 BC was the third child to Ptolemy XII. The, the Ptolemaic dynasty, the Macedonian Greek royal family originally had its ties to Alexander the Great. So they were ruling Egypt for a long, long time. Male rulers took the name Ptolemy and queens were, well, Cleopatra. Her lineage runs deep in the heart of Egypt, but Cleopatra, fun fact, was number nine, not Egyptian. Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers lasting for centuries. DNA-wise, she was barely Egyptian. But as she grew up, she was determined to learn Egyptian ways, and due to political structure, she started to style herself as the goddess Isis. She was the first Cleopatra that claimed to be Isis after the third Cleopatra. Yeah, there's a lot more Cleopatras than you thought. Number eight. 
family problems. When Ptolemy VII died back in 51 BC, naturally the throne was passed down to his son, Ptolemy the Eighth, and of course Cleopatra the seventh. So both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra only being 18 and her brother being 10 years old. So Cleopatra became the main bread and butter. She was the ruler, and in typical ancient fashion, the two had to get married. You gotta keep it in the family. A couple years passed, and with Cleopatra trying to run the show, little brother wasn't having it. Or rather, her husband and co-ruler wasn't having it. Eventually, Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria, and her greed for power over her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her completely driven out. But don't fret, she's coming back to Alexandria soon, and she's got a really cool idea of how to sneak back in the front doors with her new man, but I'll get to that later on. Number seven, love and power. It's often thought that Cleopatra just married her brothers, more than one, got power, and then charmed Caesar and Mark Antony, and then Bob's your uncle. While she wasn't really down for any of this, she didn't seek this lifestyle out per se, nor did her 10-year-old brother. I'm sure it wasn't ideal to be that stressed out when you're that young. I got a flat bike tire at 10, I didn't get Egypt. Know what I mean? Cleopatra once said, as the goddess Isis, the most Egyptian of gods, married her brother Osiris, so in the process of becoming Egyptian, that is, becoming the ruling house of Egypt, although by lineage we were pure Macedonian Greek, we Ptolemies adopted some ancient Egyptian customs that others found shocking. One was brother-sister marriage, as the pharaohs had done earlier. Thus, my mother and father were actually half-siblings, and I was forced, in turn, to marry my brothers, although it was a marriage in form only. Her relationship had true political advantage, but the way she felt about Julius Caesar was true. He had truly earned her love, not just lust. Not only would I never harm him, but I would kill anyone who tried to. Damn, ride or die. Nobody prepared me to feel so fiercely loyal to him and so instantly bound. Number six, Julius Caesar. Nicknamed the Bald's Adulterer, which is now my new favorite diss ever, Julius Caesar had a history of his own, and his, rather than family and power, was lust. He was known to hook up with tons of people and to get them to fall in love with him just so he could use their power. So of course the two crossed paths in October 50 BCE, Cleopatra had been kicked out pretty much of the family, so she fled to Syria, but she kept busy. She established an army and returned two years later to face her brother. At the same time now, the Roman general Pompey was taken out. Plus the arrival of one Julius adulterer bald Caesar. The air was calm, it was peaceful for a hot minute, and Cleopatra knew that during this time, she needed all the support she could get, specifically now from the Romans. At the same time, Caesar was looking to collect debts from Cleopatra's father, so they both felt the need for each other in some way. It was a match made in heaven. Number five, sneaking back in. The pair became lovers, and it may have been love at first sight. Remember Caesar's really cool nickname? Well, Cleopatra had some wild methods herself. You know, believing she was the goddess Isis, she tried to appear as the goddess on the regular. So she was committed. She made these dazzling entrances whenever she could, but in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria, during that family feud with Ptolemy the Eighth, she wanted to meet the Roman general, but she didn't want to be seen. That would cause some drama. So she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom and then unraveled. Then out comes boop, boop, Cleopatra. She won the heart of Rome's future dictator and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Nice. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, of course, and in the following battle, Ptolemy drowned in the Nile, resulting in Cleopatra's true return to power. Number four. Watch the throne. Now this sounds like they would rule the world together, or they should have, but you know, Egyptian tradition already set her love life in stone. She had to marry her other brother, Ptolemy the, you guessed it, ninth. Caesar was already married, but that didn't really matter for the bald adulterer now, did it? Cleopatra and Julius did have a child, and following Caesar's assassination in 44 BC, Cleopatra had her brother, husband, and co-ruler killed. She's just taken out all of her family, this is crazy. But she did so to ensure that her own son, with Caesar, appropriately named Caesarion, would be the next in line for power. Her sister as well, she had a hand in her execution, Arsinoe. Doesn't matter if you're family or not, if you're a threat to her throne, you're getting diced. Number three, Caesar and Mark Antony. We need to dive into detail about Caesar's death and what happened with Mark Antony. So when Cleopatra originally took Caesar's hand in 46 BC, it wasn't exactly chill. Caesar was very vocal about the fact that Cleopatra was his other lady, his other boo, and at one point Cleopatra and their son, Caesarion, came to visit him in the city, and he was pumped. He had the statue for her built right in the temple of the Venus Genetrix, and Romans were obviously upset, to say the least. 
They ended up stabbing Caesar to death in the Roman Senate in 44 BC, so just a couple of years after that. Her time with Caesar had long-term effects on the Romans, so women started to dress like her. So much so that now we're misidentifying Cleopatra's body many times over and over again because of this exact reason. Later in 41 BC, she met Mark Anthony, and again, she made a dazzling entrance. She arrived on a golden barge equipped with oars made of pure silver and massive purple sails. You would see her coming. She was emulating a different goddess. This time around, she was going for the Aphrodite look with attendants dressed up as Cupid fanning her down. So extra, what a diva. Well, not really a diva, rather what a planner, because Mark considered himself the embodiment of the Greek god Dionysus. 41 BC, their love life had now ignited, and again, she was being used for her riches, and he was being used to protect her crown. They lived a comfortable life full of lust and leisure for a bit. They actually made their own club, a drinking club named the Inimitable Livers. This was from 41 to 40 BC, and members of the club would partake in all these feasts and games, just wine everywhere. And after a few drinks, Cleopatra and Anthony would disguise themselves and then go into the streets of Alexandria and prank locals. That's like when James Corden does the crosswalk musical thing, only i definitely rather watch these two. Number two, her death. In 30 BC, Cleopatra and Anthony took their own lives. This happened right after Octavian forces followed them to Alexandria. Now, one of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra herself met her fate. Now, it's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit. Cleopatra apparently allowed a poisonous snake to end her life, or was it something entirely different? Was she ahead of the game here too? Instead of a bite from an asp, Greek and Roman historians believe that she did even more here. It's theorized that she poisoned herself using toxins and she herself administered the poison using a hairpin. So Anthony fell onto his own sword and Cleopatra poked herself with poison. Even the way these historical figures went out aligns with their personality and leadership. Because like I said off the top, Cleopatra was brilliant, specifically in chemistry. Nobody really knows, but this theory of her poisoning herself definitely checks out. But where's the body? Number one, her tomb. So her death is one thing, but cut to today, we're preserving as much as we can about ancient Egyptians. We're trying to learn more. Ramses II literally got a legal passport thousands of years after he died because officials felt bad marking the mummy as luggage. We're literally digging up the past to find her tomb now. The last queen of Egypt has been lost for over 2,000 years, and we might be getting close to finding her, maybe. There's a site called Tapasiris Magna. It's about 30 miles west of Alexandria, and for about 15 years now, excavation teams have been carefully finding remains that date back to that time, that go back to 30 BC. They found coins that were created during her ruling, so we're getting close. There's of course many who believe we're not getting close at all and that we'll never find her. And they're party poopers, but they also may have a valid theory. Many scholars believe the queen was buried inside Alexandria, but that many years ago, it's possible she's now underwater. Due to coastal erosion, there's a section of Cleopatra's palace that is now underwater, so it really is up to chance. What do you guys think though? Will the lost queen of Egypt ever be found, or do you think she was already found and nobody knows? Let us know your theories down below. Number 10. Construction. We can't talk about ancient Egypt and the mysteries still unsolved there if we don't start on how the hell these things were built. And also, it's not just like three pyramids. There's 118 of these things. When did they have time to construct all of these? Ropes? Pulley systems? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Ramps? Ramps. Ramps would have been a mile long against the pyramid's height. That's like hundreds of years right there. You ever dug a hole in your backyard? Two feet. It's like six hours right there. And a sore back. Some have theorized a water hydraulic system was used to transport the carved rocks up slopes and tubes with tidal power. Okay, better, better. But like, how did they line up the rocks so perfectly and so square at the top. One inch off and every carpenter knows that's gonna shift everything. Also, the alignment to true north, the odd coincidences with the dimensions resembling the cosmos, they couldn't have known back then, you know? Buckle up, it's only gonna get weirder. Number nine, Chamber of Secrets. In 2017, scientists were able to peek inside the Great Pyramid finally using modern day physics. Particles, actually. What they found revealed numerous hidden secret chambers and rooms that were thought to never exist. The most bizarre discoveries was a massive unknown void nearly 100 feet long that lays just above the pyramid's grand gallery. Khufu, also known as the Great Pyramid, was received the most attention due to its size and age, but it wasn't the only chamber they found. No. Gold, mummies, manuscripts, ancient technology. What lies inside these voids? Also, how the hell did they floor and roof a room that's unaccessible? How do you build that inside such a small chamber already? Muon tomography uses cosmic rays of muons and generates a 3D image through nearly any material. This technology is groundbreaking. Literally. Uh, yeah, yep, yep, found it. There it is. 
Number eight, the Saqqara Temple. The Pyramid of Djoser, also known as the Step Pyramid, is an archaeological site in the Saqqara necropolis. The discovery of a 4,400 year old tomb, now seen as UNESCO's World Heritage Site, is the six tier four-sided structure, which very well may be the earliest colossal stone structure in Egypt, and possibly the world. Stone mounds were made in Europe for millennia, but it was the pyramid shape that started here. It was built 27th century BC during the third dynasty for the pharaoh Djoser. The pyramid is the center of a huge complex and an enormous courtyard surrounded by ceremonial structures and decorations. Its architect was created from THE Egyptian architect himself, Imhotep, the high priest of the god Ra. This guy was like the building manager you know, the head architect. In fact, wasn't even found or really even studied till about the 1920s and was recently excavated in 2018. The pyramid went through several revisions over the years and in March 2020, the pyramid was officially reopened for visitors after a 14 year fix up. Check out Netflix, they do a great documentary on this. Number seven, Queen Nefertiti, the queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, the beloved royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshiped solely the sun disk Aten as their one and only god. Oh, blasphemy! She reigned during what was arguably the wealthiest and most lavish period of, of ancient Egypt. Here's the weird part. We don't know where she is. Usually kings and queens are buried in very spiritual, very high ranked places like the royal tomb. Easy to find. But nope, no one can find her or even know what happened to her. In 2015, archaeologists thought with high resolution scans, voids that are behind the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb proposed maybe that she was there. Nope, no Nefertiti. In 2003, archaeologists thought through the hair DNA, Nefertiti's mummy may have been quote the younger lady. Nope. Turns out it was just Tutankhamun's mom. So what exactly happened to this famously revered queen? Who knows? Aliens, dude. When in doubt, always aliens. You know what I mean? Number six, King Tut's death. When archaeologists opened a sarcophagus in Egypt's Valley of the Kings for the first time in 1923, it was the discovery of a lifetime. The ancient Egyptian boy king, King Tutankhamun, the burial chamber of the 19 year old who ruled 3,300 years ago. But why did he die so young? DNA tests and CT scans show he suffered from malaria, a broken leg, and congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, common amongst royalty. Ouch. Because of his tomb's extremely small size, historians think King Tut's death must have been unexpected and his burial rushed by A, who succeeded him as a pharaoh. The tomb's chambers were packed to the brim with more than 5,000 artifacts including furniture, chariots, clothes, weapons, and 130 of the king's walking sticks. A 24 pound solid gold mask was placed over him and he was laid in a series of containers, three golden coffins, and a granite sarcophagus. His death still has scientists scratching their heads. Also, look up how many archeologists died months after the cursed tomb had been raided. Yeah, you don't want to know. Number five, the lost labyrinth. Archaeologists uncovered what's believed to be the remains of a long lost labyrinth below the sand of the pyramid of Hawara, known as quote, the labyrinth. Built by Amenhet III, it was the most visited sites of the ancient world. Greek Herodotus claimed to have counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid's funeral complex during the fifth century BC. According to them, the underground temple consists of over 3,000 rooms filled with remarkable hieroglyphics and paintings. Close too, located less than 100 kilometers from Cairo. In 2008, with the aid of ground penetrating technology, a Belgian Egyptian expedition was able to confirm the presence of an enormous underground temple. With with no visible remains, the story was thought to be a legend passed down until Egyptologists uncovered its foundations in the 1800s. The results of this expedition indicate the presence of grid-like structures deep beneath the sand. Please tell me there's no minotaur just running around down there. Okay. Number four, the mystery queen. Archaeologists have unearthed a tomb of a previously unknown queen believed to have been the wife of Pharaoh Neferefra, who ruled 4,500 years ago. The tomb was discovered in Abu Sur, an old kingdom necropolis southwest of Cairo, where there are several pyramids dedicated to the pharaohs of the fifth dynasty. The name of his wife had not been known until recently. She was Kenta Kaz, renowned as the mother of two Egyptian pharaohs. Kenta Kaz I is a mysterious woman who ruled in the fourth dynasty dynasty and has archaeologists puzzled at her burial complex in Giza. Though rough evidence for ancient Egyptian queens, the remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within the necropolis until its excavation in the late 1930s. Hieroglyphic inscriptions concerning her title had been discovered and subsequently became open for interpretation. Her title was initially regarded to be quote, King of Upper and Lower Egypt and quote, Mother of King of Upper and Lower Egypt. So who was this mysterious powerful figure in ancient Egypt? Who was she? Number three, 
the dendrolites. All these tombs and underground chambers, how the hell did they see anything under there? Well, we really don't know, but we have some sort of direction. These ancient battery looking light bulbish things could have maybe been the power source. Ancient Egypt seems to be full of keyholes, drill holes, and shafts that are literally impossible without high powered tools. Most people say aliens, me included, but I also say the Dendera light bulbs. They've been theorized as being some sort of battery. The Hothor temple at Dendera contains several relief depictions, Harsimtus in the form of a snake emerging from a lotus flower. The Dendera light is a variation of this mode of showing Harsimtus in an oval container, a snake inside taking a number of humans to lift, and it holds apparent meanings of the start of creation. Look, I don't care what you say, this thing is a light bulb. It's got a filament. And coils? Come on, drill holes? They couldn't have just lit fires underground? The smoke? The heat? I don't think so. Now, a couple of DeWalts. <laughs> just sanding up the pyramids real nice, you know? Who knows? Who knows? Number two. The city of Punt. The land of Punt or the ancient city of Punt was an ancient kingdom sometime back then. A trading partner of ancient Egypt. It was known for producing and exporting gold, aromatic resins, precious stones, black wood, ivory, you name it. The region is known from ancient Egyptian records of trade expeditions. At time, Punt is referred to as the land of God. No pressure archeologists. The exact location of Punt is debated and unknown by historians. Q Indiana Jones movie. Various locations have been offered southeast of Egypt, Red Sea coastal region, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, no one really knows. First deciphered in Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1822, scholars began reading Egyptian texts and the mystery got mystery -er. That's not a word. More questions arose as to where Punt was located and what happened to it. The land of Punt is written by voyagers as being praised for its lavish riches and goodness of land. Okay, so it exists somewhere. This is awesome, isn't it? Wouldn't it suck if we already found everything? We're going on an expedition, boy. Grab your thing, let's go. And coming in at the number one spot, the Sphinx. Where do I even start? Known as the oldest carved rock like ever, its age is debated literally every day due to the questions it asks scholars. Was it wind erosion? Water erosion? How many times was this thing broken and rebuilt? The Great Sphinx of Giza, the limestone statue of a reclining sphinx, a mythical creature with a head of a human and a body of a lion. Facing directly west to east, it stands on the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the Nile. The face of the sphinx appears to represent the pharaoh Khafre, although this is heavily debated as wrong gears and looking nothing like him. It's since been restored with tons of layers of limestone blocks, although still unfixed. Its nose was broken off for unknown reasons between the 3rd and 10th century. Maybe some artillery fire over the years? Who knows? The Sphinx is the oldest known sculpture in Egypt and archaeologists suggest that it was created in the Old Kingdom using unknown construction methods. Yeah, definitely that battery thing. From 1817 to 1930, this thing was buried up to its neck and written and drawn about for centuries. I wonder what other secrets lay under her right now. I guess we'll eventually find out someday. I wonder what else is just waiting to be dug up, you know? Imagine they find a cell phone 